So at number 10 here we have the green lacewing, uh, sometimes known as the common lacewing. Uh, it's probably one of the more prevalent uh, beneficial insects that we have in the landscape. So we have the adult right here. Uh, these are the eggs, the larvae. So the eggs are, are usually going to be laid on the undersides of leaves on these kind of tiny stalks. Uh, the purpose of that is just to kind of keep the eggs out of reach from other predators that, that may be in the environment. So whenever you see this, um, that's really characteristic of lacewing eggs, so that's something that you want to leave alone uh, on the leaf surface. So when those eggs hatch, uh, this is the larval stage here. Uh, the larvae are sometimes known as aphid lions because they, they consume uh, many aphids, uh, some species uh, over, over 300 aphids per week, just a single larva. Uh, so you can imagine if you have a, a good population of those in your garden, they can, they can do some serious damage to to those aphid populations. They also feed on other small soft-bodied insects like white flies, mice, uh, things like that. Uh, the adult, uh, probably not going to see the adult too often. They're more nocturnal. Uh, if you have porch lights on, they can be attracted to the porch lights. Uh, you may see them flying during the day if you disturb vegetation that they're, they're resting in. Uh, but the adults also feed uh, on, on small soft-bodied insects as well. Uh, generally not as much as the larvae though, so the larvae are, are, are very important. Uh, it's kind of hard to see from this picture, but the larvae have these kind of really large mandibles or jaws which they use to, to grasp prey. Um, they can kind of look a little bit frightening, so people tend to kill them. Uh, again, you don't want to do that because they are uh, very beneficial. Uh, assassin bugs, uh, also very important predators in the landscape. Um, one of the more common uh, assassin bug species that we have is the wheel bug. Uh, they call it the wheel bug because of this kind of unique uh, ridge that they have on their thorax. Kind of looks like uh, spokes uh, going around the wheel there. Uh, this can be a very large insect as an adult. Uh, it can get up to about an inch and a half long. Uh, it has piercing sucking mouth parts, which it uses to basically pierce into the bug that it's feeding on. So here's a nymphal assassin bug. Uh, the immature, uh, so it's piercing its beak in this Colorado potato beetle larvae and, and basically sucks out the juices uh, like a straw. Um, again, these are very beneficial. They feed on uh, various caterpillar pests, uh, some of your beetle larvae, beetle pests, um, and basically whatever it can catch. Uh, they're, they're very, very good beneficial insects to have. Uh, soldier beetles coming in at number eight. Uh, Soldier beetles are, are another uh, beneficial insect. This is the larvae here. The larvae live in the soil where they feed on, on insects in the soil. Uh, the adult, uh, this is the Pennsylvania leatherwing. This is the one of the more common species that we have in the area. Uh, this guy also feeds on insects as an adult, but it, it also feeds on pollen and nectar. Um, so they're very common uh, in, in flowering plants, uh, and they can actually aid in, in pollination of some of those flowering plants. Uh, I, I see them a lot in, in flowers and trees, so dogwoods, um, you know, some, some of your earlier flowering cherries, uh, goldenrod in the fall, uh, they, they can be common in that as well. So they'll feed on pollen and nectar, help distribute that pollen, aid pollination. And then these are the larvae, again, feeding on some of those, those insects that are, that are going to be in that in the soil. Uh, my new pirate bug. Uh, my new pirate bug also has piercing sucking mouth parts that it uses to, to basically pierce into the insects and feed. Uh, these guys are, are very small. So this is the, the nymphal stage right here. Um, notice it doesn't have the fully developed wings. Kind of a different color from the adult. The adults have very characteristic kind of a, a black and white checkered pattern. Uh, but they also feed on a wide variety of insects, aphids, thrips, white flies. Uh, again, very beneficial beneficial to have uh, in, in the landscape. Uh, I should probably mention too that, that minute pirate bugs, uh, common lacewing, um, two that I've mentioned so far, uh, you can purchase those online. Uh, there's various online suppliers that will sell these insects for uh, biological control purposes. Uh, generally I recommend uh, releasing these in an enclosed space such as a greenhouse or, or a high tunnel system. Uh, because they are generalist predators, uh, so there's really nothing stopping them from moving outside of the landscape. So if you uh, have an area 
um, you know, that you can kind of keep them somewhat contained in, uh, then they can be very beneficial. If you just release them in an outdoor garden, uh, again, there's nothing really that's going to keep them there. They're, they're likely to just, just leave. Uh, Big-eyed bug. Uh, this is another another bug. They call it big-eyed bug because they have very large compound eyes. Uh, here's a nymphal stage here. Again, nymphal stage, not reproductively mature. Uh, doesn't have those fully functioning wings the adults do. Um, big-eyed bug, very common in lawns, uh, lawn landscapes where they feed on chinch bug, uh, another nipter and another bug pest uh, in lawn. Uh, sometimes they can be uh, misidentified as pests, but people uh, you know, spray their lawn with an insecticide and wipe these guys out and they have further problems. Uh, so if you have chinch bug problems in your lawn, it's a good idea to look for these guys uh, before you treat with an insecticide. Uh, a lot of the lawn uh, insecticides that are used, uh, a lot of them for chinch bug and, and some of these other pests uh, contain a pyrethroid. Those pyrethroids are highly toxic to these insects and, and will wipe them out. Uh, so you want to be careful with that. Uh, Big-eyed bug can be found in other agricultural systems as well. Um, again, they, they feed on a wide variety of, of small insects, uh, anything from aphids, white flies, uh, mites, things like that. <clears throat> Damsel bug, uh, another bug, uh, family Navidae. Uh, these guys are also beneficial. I, I see these quite a bit in, in grasses, tall grasses, but, but again, they can be found throughout the landscape. Uh, so this is the nymphal stage here. Uh, again, no fully functioning wings, a little bit different color than the adults. The adults uh, somewhat elongate, uh, fairly small, about a quarter inch in size. Um, generally a drab color, drab brown, uh, maybe even a, a kind of a lightish yellow, but tend to be more drab brown in color. Um, a little bit, they hunt a little bit like uh, uh, praying mantis. They, they have that those four legs or those front legs that they use for grasping prey. Um, so they can they can ambush uh, or sometimes stalk their prey, but they'll use those grasping legs uh, to grab it, bring it in, and then use those piercing, sucking mouth parts to, to stab into the insect and feed on it. Uh, so this one's feeding on a plant bug, uh, a ligus bug. Taking that that guy out of it. Uh, serpent flies, uh, so these are a, a, a true fly, uh, very beneficial to have. So this is the larvae, uh, fly larvae are called maggots. So this is the maggot larvae here, uh, and they are parasitic. Um, they feed on various insects, this guy's feeding on aphids, um, and then these are the adults. The adults tend to mimic bees or wasps in coloration. Um, so they can be misidentified uh, for, for those insects quite often. Um, but as adults, they, they tend to feed on nectar, uh, flowers, so they aid in pollination. They tend to have uh, some hairs on the body, too, which, which uh, kind of facilitate that, that, those pollination services, get those pollen on the hair and can transfer it to various flowers. Um, one question I get asked a lot is, how do you identify some of these beneficial flies uh, from, from things like bees and wasps? Uh, so flies have just one pair of wings, two, two membranous wings, whereas bees and wasps have four membranous wings. Uh, flies do have four wings, but those hind wings are, are greatly reduced. You can't see those uh, unless you have a, a, a magnifying lens or, or a microscope to look at those. So it looks like they just have that, that those one pair of membranous wings. Uh, also, if you look at the eyes, uh, the eyes are very large, and they, they uh, kind of converge or meet at the top of the head or, or almost meet at the top of the head, whereas your bees and wasps, the eyes are going to be located um, at the sides of the head, so they're, they're spaced wide uh, apart. Also, your bees and wasps have long elbowed antennae, whereas your flies have very short antennae, so you're not going to really see those antennae if you, unless you look very close. So that's a good way to recognize these flies. Also, serpent flies or hover flies, they call them hover flies because they hover uh, above the flowers, and, and bees and wasps, they, they don't do that. So to see uh, an insect hovering around the flower, it's probably this guy. So you kind of get a one-two punch. You, you get, um, you know, the larvae take care of, taking care of some of those, those pest insects, and then the adults uh, that greatly aid in pollination. Uh, ground beetles come in at number three. 
Um, I get a lot of calls about ground beetles. What are these? Are they bad? Uh, no, they're, they're very beneficial. I call them ground beetles because they spend most of their time running around on the ground actively pursuing their prey. Um, ground beetles, you can recognize them just mostly any black beetle that you see scurrying around on the ground is probably going to be these guys. Uh, they can range in size from uh, anywhere from a quarter inch to, you know, up to, up to two inches in size sometimes. Uh, but they have these chewing mouth parts, very large mandibles or jaws which they use to capture prey. Uh, feeding on anything uh, that's on or or in the soil. Uh, lady beetles come in at number two. A lot of different species of lady beetles out there. Uh, this is the twice stab lady beetle. I see this commonly in a lot of orchard systems, tree fruit orchards. Uh, this is Coleo megilla maculata. I see this this guy a lot uh, as well. Um, this you may recognize is the the multicolored Asian lady beetle. So this is, can be a pest in homes in the fall and winter, but you know outside it, it really does a good job taking care of aphids and other small insects. Um, you can recognize the Asian lady beetle from some of these these native ones by looking at this region of the thorax called the prothorax. It's going to be kind of a, a cream, white cream color, and you're going to see four dots, four black dots that kind of look like a W. And so that's one way to recognize um, the multicolored Asian lady beetle from some of our other uh, lady beetle species that look uh, kind of similar. Uh, but here's the different life stages. Um, the larvae uh, right here, the pupa, and the adult. Uh, so a lot of people don't recognize the larvae, but uh, kind of look like little alligators. Uh, very, again, very beneficial, more, more so than the adults because they feed on more, more of those insects than the adults do. Uh, the adults also feed on insects, but, but not to the level that the larvae do. Um, I get a lot of calls about, you know, I see these kind of orange things on, on my leaves or stuck to the top of my leaves, that's, that's the pupa, uh, pupal stage right there. So again, uh, I want to leave, leave those alone if you see them, come pluck them and catch it. And last I have the honeybee at number one, but really this can go for, for any bee. Um, you know, they, they greatly aid in pollination services, so they do, do a lot of good in the landscape. Uh, honeybee is actually not native to North America. It's, it's from Europe. European honeybee uh, brought over in the 1600s with the early colonists. Um, of course, they can be considered a domesticated animal because we move the hives around. We get various products from them, such as honey. Um, but honeybees, as well as some of our native species, bee species, uh, really taking a hit uh, recently. Uh, one of the big ones that's affecting our native bee species species is uh, habitat loss. So a lot of land being devoted to industrial agriculture, to urban development. Uh, so a lot of the flowers that they kind of co-evolved with, that they need for their survival, are no longer there, or no longer there at the quantities you know, for, for survival. So uh, a lot of problems occurring uh, with habitat loss. Uh, honeybees, uh, they have multiple factors affecting them. Uh, of course, since they get moved around a lot, uh, you know, Start out in California with the almond orchards and move around to you know, Texas, Florida, up to the Dakotas. Um, and a lot of times they're, they're placed in these, these big agricultural fields where it's just one plant. Um, honeybees are, are a species that forages on a wide variety of, of plants. So they need a diverse diet. Uh, when they're kind of forced to feed on just a single host plant, uh, they're not getting a lot of the nutrients they, they need. So it makes them stressed, basically. Of course, they have problems with various parasites as well, parasites and diseases. Uh, of course, uh, varroa mites, one of the big ones, uh, parasitic mite. And you know, a lot of these, these uh, you know, pesticides that you use to control varroa mites and these diseases also affect the honeybee negatively. Um, and of course, habitat loss uh, causing problems and then misuse of insecticides can also cause problems. Um, so it's just, uh, oh, one of the questions I get is how, how can I increase the number of beneficial insects uh, that I have in my landscape? Uh, of course, as, as I mentioned, for some of these species, you can, you can buy them online from various suppliers. They can purchase them if you want. Uh, but really, if you want to keep them in the landscape, you need to have some type of food source for them. And, and one of the great ways to, to do that is to plant a lot of flowering plow, uh, plant a lot of flowering uh, plants. Uh, so this will be good for your, your, you know, your surface flies, your, your bee species, but it would also be good for some of those 
those predatory insects as well, because when insects are in low supply, they can easily move to um, these flower sources to get you know, the pollen uh, as kind of that protein source and the nectar as kind of the sugar source to tide them over until you know, other insects pop up that they, they can feed on. 